All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again this week for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. We're going to give it just a little bit of time to allow the room to fill up a little. I hope you're having a great day. Give it just a moment. All right. Welcome again. We'll just wait just one more moment before we go ahead and get started. All righty. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on quantitative measurements of hemophiliac joint tissues by point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, and there's a little bit more to your title than I actually have written down, so I apologize for that. But my name is Alston Murtha, and I'm the manager of strategic communications here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our speaker after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, July 15th. I am joined today by Dr. Akram Mesle Shayev. How was that? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that <was> sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much. Um... Hi everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me today uh, to talk about some of our uh, research uh, that we've been doing on uh, quantitative measurements of hemophilic joint tissue by point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, so I'll just get started. Okay, so I have uh, no disclosures, but uh, part of this research was done by a Pfizer hemophilia grant and an HRSA grant. And uh, a Jade Protocol is copyrighted and licensed by the University of California, San Diego. So um, hemophilic arthropathy. Uh, so hemophilia is characterized uh, by recurrent uh, joint bleeding. And these joint bleeds uh, cause blood degradation and product deposition, leave, uh, leading to inflammation and hypertrophy. And this becomes a... a recurrent cycle of multiple joint bleeds, which ultimately causes a uh, destruction of the cartilage of the joints and bone erosion, which leads to the arthritis that uh, we observe in patients with hemophilia. This complication uh, is common. It increases with age. Uh, it leads to uh, a lot of pain and, and loss of motion and decreases quality of life in these individuals. And there has been a lot of advancements in hemophilia uh, over the years, but despite modern uh, prophylactic treatments, there is still a high prevalence of chronic pain, target joints, uh, joint bleeds, and decreased mobility. And in some studies, uh, these are coded as much as, you know, between 40 to 60% of patients having uh, these uh, symptoms and complications as early as their early 20s. And early joint damage uh, predicts progression of arthropathy. So uh, we need to do better and uh, try to uh, study how to detect uh, the, the joint damage early on and hopefully intervene on them. So prompt detection of arthropathy progression is critical. And there's a lot of imaging modalities uh, that are available to look into this, and uh, I'll go over them. So which imaging modalities are available? Okay. So first are x-rays, specifically Peterson scores. Uh, these uh, are radiographic imaging of the joint destruction, and they mainly look at the bone structure. Uh, they have some disadvantages in that it can early joint damage can escape clinical diagnosis, and this can even be up to a decade, uh, particularly for the ankle. And it doesn't allow uh, evaluation of the soft tissue around the joint. MRI uh, is the gold standard, the imaging modality of choice to evaluate 
uh, hemophilic arthropathy because it allows uh, evaluation of both the bone structure and also the soft tissue structure. Um, there's a lot of disadvantages to MRI, uh, specifically the cost is, is very expensive compared with x-rays or ultrasound, for example. It can be very time consuming. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of the patients listening uh, in who had an MRI can you know, take uh, a long time to get an MRI for a single joint. And if you have uh, arthritis in multiple joints, that's, uh, that can be very time consuming uh, to do uh, multiple MRIs uh, every few years. It also is difficult to perform in children uh, who need to like lay still and in adults uh, who have uh, claustrophobia. Um, so there has been um, a, a strive to use point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound. So the word point of care uh, for the patients in the audience, it means that this ultrasound is done in the clinic at the bedside as compared as your doctor ordering an ultrasound and going uh, to be done by uh, in the, out of the audio department. Uh, so this can be done by your uh, physician or a physical therapist or anyone in clinic that is trained to do that. Um, we started uh, early on as a method to detect uh, joint bleeds. And one of the advantages is that it allows uh, to detect dy dynamic changes in the joint. And it can assess both the soft tissue and the bone structures. Uh, these are some images. I'm going to go a little bit more into detail uh, in these images uh, uh, in later slides. Uh, but these, uh, and I will explain what where to look at cartilage uh, integrity and soft tissue expansion in, in multiple slides. Ahead. Another advantage of ultrasound is it allows uh, distinction of a simple. Uh, effusions versus complex effusions, meaning uh, distinguishing uh, if there's fluid that is from blood, from bleeding. So here, for example, a simple effusion, you can see that is uh, anechoic, meaning it's completely black, versus here, uh, it's a bloody effusion. In a ultrasound image, it's kind of uh, echoic, which is kind of like hazy, if you can see the difference between here and here. Versus in the MRI, uh, that distinction is uh, uh, much more challenging. So to summarize, x-rays are insensitive to early soft tissue changes detections prior to irreversible cartilage damage. Uh, while MRI is the gold standard, it allows to be sensitive to soft tissue changes, but it can be time consuming, has a lot of high cost, and can be cumbersome. So there's a strive to use point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound in the clinic because it's simple, it's inexpensive, it's convenient, and it's radiation free. And it can be used in clinic by a non-radiologist. So taking this into consideration, um, our uh, center uh, developed uh, the Joint Tissue Activity and Damage Exam, uh, JADE for short, uh, protocol. Uh, this is a very sensitive uh, protocol for detection of synovial changes, uh, osteochondral changes, and vascular changes. Uh, it allows uh, quantitative measurements up to one-tenth of the millimeter. And it has been uh, validated uh, per OMRAC guidelines. And these are international uh, guidelines, um, outcome measure and rheumatology, which basically standardize uh, different imaging modalities for different types of arthritis. And it has been validated uh, for the pathological tissue recognition level, and also has been shown to have in high intra-interrater and interoperator reliability. And these uh, findings for this particular protocol, um, the validation steps and the sensitivity to detect uh, these uh, changes have been uh, previously uh, published by uh, our center. Uh, this is... Um, the butterfly device, it's almost uh, the size of, of my hand. Um, and basically, uh, you can see a phone next to it. And we can uh, uh, hook this up into the phone. And it allows, uh, when we use it in clinic, it allows uh, us to show it to the patient uh, in, in real life and also save these images uh, to the chart of the patient. And this can be helpful uh, because you have like a baseline and you could compare it in future visits. Okay, 
So this uh, uh, introduction uh, was based on what led us to uh, our protocol. Another step was to see, uh, to further validate the protocol, we wanted to explore the associations of the joint uh, domains with uh, clinical measurements. And our aim was to correlate uh, the point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound measurements in three domains at the joint level, which are the osteochondral alterations, cartilage thickness, and soft tissue thickness. And we wanted to correlate these with both clinical and functional joint assessments. So to do that, uh, we did a study um, which was in three different centers. And our target population that was recruited in the study was uh, patients with congenital hemophilia A or B who had uh, any type of arthropathy and had to be older than 18 years of age. They all had three different visits. One was at baseline, was, was an interval visit 12 to 18 months from the first visit. And there was an exit visit, which was 24 to 36 months after the first visit. The outcomes that I will be discussing in the next few uh, minutes are the ultrasound jade measurements, which are the three joint domains. The hemophilia joint health score. This is a clinical score that looks at arthropathy and has been validated in adults. And then the total arc is a, a clinical, uh, a functional uh, measurement. And what that is, is the sum of flexion and extension degrees of range of motion, meaning the sum of how much you can flex the joint and extend it. So um, we did three measurements for the elbow, eight measurements for the knee, and four measurements for the ankle, which account and each patient or participant had uh, both sides measured. So approximately 30 measurements per patient, and there were 44 patients, which accounts to almost 1,300 measurements. And there were three visits, so almost 4,000 measurements. And uh, these are just the views. Um, for the elbows, I mentioned there were three views, uh, eight views for the knee and four views for the ankle. So the baseline characteristics of uh, the patients that participated in uh, this study, um, these are the three centers, LA, Seattle, and San Diego. And most of the patients were, had hemophilia A and were severe. Uh, most were white. The median age was 36. And there was a wide, uh, variability in terms of HHS scores across uh, the participants. There was, as I mentioned, there were 161 visits, approximately 768 routine joint scans. Okay. So let's talk about, a little bit about the results and what we found uh, with uh, our, the protocol of our center. So in the big picture, and I'll go over uh, more detail in the next few slides, but just looking at the big picture, deteriorating arthropathy, which means uh, your HJHS score is higher, increasing, or your total arc is declining. Those two things mean that there's worse arthropathy of each joint was associated with jade measurements in the expected direction, in the direction that we would have expected which is increased length of osteochondral alterations, increased soft tissue expansion, and decreased uh, cartilage thickness. We also saw that the US, the ultrasound measurement associations were the strongest in the elbow, followed by the knee, and followed by the ankle. Okay. So there are three domains, as I mentioned. Uh, the first domain is the osteochondral alteration, and as an example, uh, I'm showing in this uh, slide the joint of the elbow, which is the homeroradial joint short axis. Uh, and the figure A uh, is a normal osteochondral uh, alteration surface. So this is the muscle, this is the humeroradial joint, uh, this is the cartilage. And the osteochondral surface 
uh, in a normal uh, in, a, in a normal joint uh, is characterized by a very white reflective line, as you can see here. In a patient with hemophilia, uh, that white reflective line is lost. So this is an abnormal uh, osteochondrial surface. This in figure C is the way we, uh, the muscus pro position, uh, where we place it in the, uh, in the arm. And this is just a diagram of the anatomy. So basically we're, what we're looking at when we talk about osteochondral alterations is um, how much of this white uh, reflective line is lost. So for the elbow, um, length of osteochondral alterations, uh, what we saw in, in the prior slide is in the X axis. So the more the osteochondral alteration, the worse. And there are two figures here. So in this figure on the left is HHS score. So the more the HHS score, the worse it is. So as we can see here in the elbow joint, increasing length of osteochondral alteration, the more the osteochondral alteration, the worse is the HHS, which is what would we expect. And the figure on the right is the total arc. And here, this is the lower the total arc, the worse the arthropathy. So the increasing, as the length of osteochondral alteration increases, the total arc decreases. Okay. Second is the knee. Uh, I didn't show here the anatomy of the knee, but it's pretty much a uh, similar uh, concept in terms of the white reflective line. Again, uh, in the x-axis here in this line here is the length of osteochondral alterations. In the left is the knee AJHS, and in the right graph is the total arc. And in the knee joint, increasing length of osteochondral alteration is associated with worsening AJHS, and it's also associated with worsening total arc. Next is the ankle. And in, similarly, this is length of osteochondral alteration. The more the osteochondral alteration, the worse it is. So in the ankle joint, increasing length of osteochondral alteration is associated with worsening HHS and worsening total arc. The second domain that we look at in the joints in addition to osteochondral alteration is the cartilage thickness. How thick is the cartilage in the, in the joint? And as an example, so uh, to have a, a pictorial picture, I'm using the elbow again. This is the humeral radial joint log axis. This is the muscle and this is the cartilage. And in figure A is a normal cartilage. And what we see is intact cartilage is characterized by a continuous hypoechoic, which is the black, a structure lining the bony surface. And we measure the thickness of this area. In a patient with a hemophilia, this cartilage is abnormally thin compared with this one. Figure C is the muscus pro position. Figure D is the elbow diagram anatomy. Okay, so here uh, the association is the opposite because the less the cartilage thickness, the less cartilage you have, uh, the worse the arthropathy. And the y-axis is AGHS on the left and the total arc is on the right. So decreasing cartilage thickness as you go to this direction, to the left, is associated with worsening AJHS, and it's also associated with worsening total arc. Second is the knee. Again, cartilage thickness is on the X axis. So if you go to the left direction, that's worse. So 
the left diagram is a JHS, the right diagram is tau R, and in the knee, decreasing cartilage thickness is associated with worsening AGHS and also worsening total art. Last is the ankle. And uh, we saw overall that decreasing cartilage thickness is associated with worsening AGHS and worsening total art. This uh, association was not as strong as you can see the curves are not as linear. And this is probably mainly because most of the participants uh, had in the ankle almost, they had zero cartilage left. Um, and in 2022, the arthropathic leading joint in patients with hemophilia is the ankle, which is uh, not surprising. So perhaps uh, a population who may be younger or with more cartilage can help uh, elucidate uh, better uh, this association uh, in future studies. But this was a limitation of our, our study. Um, the third domain that we look at is the uh, soft tissue expansion. Here I'm using the elbow again. Um, in figure A is a normal uh, olecranal recess. So what this means is this is the muscle. So the olecranal recess area, which is shown between the intermittent white yellow line is occupied by a hyperechoic soft tissue content versus in a patient with hemophilia, this gets filled uh, with other exogenous or other material, whether it's blood or, or other things. And you can see it that's abnormally expanded. This is the muscus proposition. And this is the elbow diagram another. So here in the x-axis, we have the soft tissue expansion of the elbow. And the more the soft tissue is expanded, the worse the arthropathy. In the, in the left diagram is AJHS, and the right diagram is total arc. And what we see is that increasing soft tissue expansion in the olecranal recess is associated with worsening AJHS and with worsening total arc. This is the knee. And in the X axis is the average and lateral medial recess, which is a soft tissue component. And similarly in the knee, increasing soft tissue expansion is associated with worsening AJHS and worsening total arc. This is the ankle capsular thickness. And again, we see that increasing soft tissue expansion is in the capsule is associated with worsening AGHS and worsening to arc in the ankle. So to summarize, jade measurements are associated with clinical and functional joint assessments in a cross-section analysis in a cohort of adults with hemophilia. The second question that we had was, is the jade protocol sensitive to have these findings reproduce, meaning at different clinic visits? So as I mentioned, we conducted the study across almost three years. And uh, I'm just going to show you some preliminary results. Uh, so this is the reproducible association analysis. And again, the summary of the results is that at each clinic visit, at each time point, each time the patient came to clinic, Deteriorating arthropathy, meaning increasing AJHS and decreasing total arc of each joint, was associated with jade measurements in the expected direction, meaning that what we saw in the ultrasound was associated with um, AJHS and total arc. As an example, I'm just going to uh, cover the, I'm having some technical difficulties. Uh, all of, uh, the osteochondral traditions. So here in the x-axis is length of osteochondral alteration. And as I previously mentioned, the, the more the osteochondral alteration, the worse the arthritis. This is the elbow joint. The baseline visit is shown in the blue line. The patients came for a midpoint visit, which is shown in the 
orange line, and then the green line is the final clinic visit. And we saw that increasing length of osteochondral alteration was associated with worsening AJHS, which is the left diagram, and with worsening total arcs, which is the right diagram, at each time point in the elbow joint. So each time the patient came, we saw that the association were reproduced. Second is the knee. And similarly, in the x-axis is left of osteochondral alterations. The left diagram is HHS. The right diagram is total arc. And increasing length of osteochondral alterations is associated with worsening AGHS and worsening total arc at each time point in the knee joint. Third is the ankle. This is length of osteochondral alterations. Left diagram is HHS, right diagram is total arc. And we observe that increasing length of osteochondral alterations was associated with worsening AJHS and worsening total arc at each time point. So to summarize, uh, direct bulk uh, uh, muscus measurements using J are highly relevant in regards to clinical and functional joint outcomes. An association was observed between jade measurements and AJHS during several visits across time, and also with total arc, although I did not uh, show those results uh, here. Our observations support that puck muscus using jade protocol could be useful to quantify joint damage and hemophilic arthropathy. Some possible next steps uh, that we're looking at are a study that, that changes longitudinally in jade measurements across the three years, meaning whether these changes were significant or not from the initial visit till the end of the study period, and the effects of incorporating jade into clinic for management of hemophilic arthropathy. And I'll open it up for questions. Thank you for listening in today. That was great. Thank you. I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. So we do have a couple questions for you. Let's see. Um, is there a difference between the Jade and Martinoli, Martinoli pro protocols? Um, the Jade protocol is different from other protocols in terms that it looks at quantitative measurements, uh, continuous measurements, Me versus the other protocols that use ultrasound uh, do not use uh, quantitative measurements. When I say quantitative, I mean like when I was observing, when I was looking at the osteochondral alterations, uh, what Jade does, it looks at how many uh, millimeters or centimeters, uh, there were changes in, in the joint in those osteochondral alterations. The other protocols uh, do not look at the quantitative measurements. They, they are semi-quantitative. Awesome. Um, can you explain what is an arc? Yes, so a uh, total arc is uh, basically uh, uh, my elbow, uh, we usually uh, look at how much it flexes, how many degrees, you know, uh, and then we take that and we see how many degrees it extends. And then we sum, we sum, we sum those two measurements and that's the total arc. How much is the patient able to flex and extend? Great, thank you. Your study had only adult patients. Does the score, do the scores differ in kids? Uh, yes, so this study is um, being validated in, uh, in adults and, and it's not in children. Some of the limitations with children is that the cartilage is not mature and it changes uh, with as the child grows. So with their the study, uh, the protocol is designed for adults uh, as of right now.
Wonderful. Um, is the reading between folks who read the results varies from the person who does? Oh, hold on. Let me reread this question in my brain first. Um, is the reading between folks who read the results vary from the person who does the U.S. versus the radiologist who reads this? Is there a variability variability between radiologist readings for the same joint? I'm not sure if that makes sense. Okay. Um, let, let me see if I can decipher this question. So, um, so the point of care musculoskeletal ultrasound is done in clinic, so it's uh, done by non-radiologists, although it can be done by radiologists, but the purpose um, of point of care ultrasound is to ideally be able to be done by someone in clinic next at the bedside next to the patient when they come to the clinic. Um, there, for this particular protocol, there is a course that is offered for um, clinicians uh, if they wish to take it. In addition, there is uh, different modules uh, available that one can become certified to be able to use uh, this uh, method. And lastly, um, we had previously shown, and I, although I didn't, I didn't show it here in, in this uh, presentation, that there is a high uh, inter and intraoperator, meaning between different operators and within the same operator who is doing the ultrasound, there is a lot of reliability and reproducibility. Uh, so these, study, these findings have been previously uh, shown for this particular protocol. Great, thank you. So what were your greatest challenges in your research? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so this study is, um, I think this, this study is, uh, is, is a small cohort, uh, you know, uh, but uh, hemophilia is a, is a rare disease. So uh, needing to, you know, recruit participants. And I think, um, I, uh, you know, we acknowledge uh, the, the eagerness of, of of our patients to participate. So that could be one of the challenges, you know, finding participants to uh, be included in these research studies. And then, um, you know, and it, it's a study that uh, it takes a lot of time, you know, uh, and also having to come um, multiple times to clinic to do these studies. Uh, so that can be a challenge. Um, uh, this uh, protocol per se uh, is going through different uh, validation steps. And this is one of the validation uh, steps uh, to look at the usefulness of this protocol. And what we showed uh, was that there are some associations uh, with what we see in the ultrasound and with some measurements that we look for in hemophilic arthropathy. And ideally, uh, future directions or future research, um, I think the ultimate goal is to try to achieve a way to find arthropathy early on and, and try to hopefully intervene on before it becomes uh, irreversible. And that's where care for patients with hemophilia has become individualized. And uh, you know every patient is different. Everyone uses different uh, prophylactic regimens. Uh, patients uh, have different uh, challenges in their lives. Some are more active than others. So we look at those all, all those measurements, um, you know, to individualize the care. And this is a complementary uh, method that one can use to look at some of the complications of patients with hemophilia. Wonderful. So do you have any next steps planned for your research or how will you build on your findings? Yes, uh, so some of the next steps that we're looking at, one is trying to see so what we saw is we saw the association at the first visit. Then we saw uh, whether those associations are reproduced at each of the three visits. The next step is to look whether those changes from the first visit to the last visit, how were they, were they significant or not? Meaning the cartilage thickness got worse, they get better. And uh, there's different statistical methods to look at those changes across time and to see the usefulness 
of the ultrasound protocol to detect those changes across time. So that's one thing. Second, uh, our center is um, one of the studies that I thought I think it's uh, pretty neat or pretty cool is they're uh, giving the ultrasound to patients uh, to you know to take home and uh, to train them to to use it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a small device, so it's, a, it's handheld. So one of the research projects is trying to see uh, whether participants can or patients can use it at their at their home and and hope to uh, distinguish uh, to, to be able to use it when they have a bleed, for example. I think one of the useful things that I may have not um, highlighted as much is that particularly in adult, in an older adult, uh, once we have a lot of arthropathy, uh, it can become a little bit difficult to distinguish whether the pain is from the arthritis versus the bleed. And there has been a lot of studies that have shown that uh, just as you grow older and the joint becomes so much damaged, you, it's hard to distinguish between those two different types of pain. So sometimes pain not necessarily translate to a bleed. Uh, so those are one of the methods where the ultrasound can be helpful to look at blood products uh, and distinguish between bleeding versus no bleeding. Great. I have one more question for you. So for our community members, how do you suggest that they participate in similar studies? Um, yeah, I think uh, asking uh, your uh, HTC center, uh, they, they all have different research protocols and different projects involved uh, when you go to your comprehensive uh, visit. Uh, some of these research are also available in, in different uh, online forums or newsletters. Um, and I think, that, I think the best bet is uh, asking your physician. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you once more for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We appreciate your time and expertise. And I'd also like to thank each one of our viewers for watching us, whether you joined us on Zoom or you're on one of our live streaming platforms. Thank you for taking the time to join us this Wednesday. Please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, July 15th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archived webinars. Also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon and have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Have a good week.